The passage of time is unrivaled. I can hardly believe it's been nearly six years since the release of Dark Souls 3. That's more than half a decade since this channel shot into the stratosphere thanks to the bosses of the Souls series. While I've ranked them and other aspects of FromSoft's growing compendium every which way under the grossly incandescent sun, it's been over half a decade since I ranked every single boss in the series on their quality from top to bottom. There's a reason I haven't gone back for an update. Top 10s revolve around the best, worst, easiest, and hardest of things not only for click-happy buzzwords, but because talking about the meh, the average, the inoffensive is so empty. Chances are, if an experience didn't polarize me, I'll hardly have much to say about it. In fact, this thought process nearly had me create a top 10 most forgettable bosses in the Souls series, until I realized kicking the mundane while seated safely in the comfort of mediocrity would be an exercise in boredom for you and I both. My single regret in never updating my boss quality marathon is missing an opportunity to gush on the underdogs. The bosses that don't get the appreciation they deserve in the top 10 best simply because this series is overloaded with spectacular bosses. Today, I'd like to make an argument for 10 runner-ups you may think about a lot or a little when looking back at the franchise. I'll argue why they offer tremendous quality to rival FromSoft's best, or at least how their achievements are worth recognition beyond a single romp between fog walls. Without further ado, here are my choices for the top 10 most underrated bosses in the Soul series. Number 10, The Duke's Dear Freya. I'm afraid if you don't like spiders, I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. FromSoft loves spider bosses nearly as much as poison swamps. Meanwhile, fan enjoyment of them couldn't be more at odds. Love them or hate them, there's no arguing they're here to ruin your day. Armored Spider is at the end of a long, long, long level with an insignificant shortcut. It has multiple gotcha mechanics like it's web slowing you to a crawl when you need to dodge or get out of dodge when it goes BOOM! Or more appropriately in Remake, lubes up the ground and sets it ablaze, forcing you to backtrack for more butt webs and fireballs. Up close, it's strange wind-ups punish hard if you whiff, diminishing already small offensive windows before the next BOOM! With huffing grass at a pace that would make Snoop Dogg blush. The fight boils down to dodge spit, eat shit, chug grass, and flail your weapon like a pool noodle till you win. Not very satisfying. Nor is having 33 spiders and a giant magical crystal shoved in every orifice of your body while you desperately try to make mashed potatoes. Rom, the limbless potato, is a boss centered around avoiding combat, instead forcing you into temp work as an exterminator for Yarnum's spider infestation. You spend more time sprinting away from ranged magic, trying to get the perfect window to call their numbers, meanwhile they spit, jump, slam, and dunk on you for counter hits that melt your HP. Also, you can go back to spud slapping. Armored Spider lacks clean design, while Rom assigns you chores, both delivering more frustration than fun. The Duke's Dear Freya succeeds where they both failed. Relying predominantly on similar get-off-me mechanics, they have much greater variety. It shares a similar mandible swipe to the Armored Spider, in tandem with a flail and whale berserk stomp that forces you away like Rom. However, there are variations on these attacks for leg stab combos, full body frontal swings, jumping slams and repositions, and a massive sweeping beam. To discern the difference up close, you'll need to be attentive to how her head and legs move as they give away her next attack. This makes all at offense costly as it tunnels your vision away from the legs. This can be remedied by a critical weakness that balances this advantage. Freya has two heads, one on each side. This creates multiple strategies. Attempting to bait longer combos or the beam to get punishment on the other head, or squaring up at the current one and avoiding its onslaught. It's certainly easier to go for the other head, but even that strategy has a weakness. Too much damage to a singular head decapitates it, forcing you to finish Freya off with a singular head. The balance between swapping butt heads, attentiveness to subtle variations in tells, and baiting advantageous attacks for extra anal flows wonderfully. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the mini spiders. Unlike Rom, their AI is far less focused on protecting Freya and more focused on hunting you down with various levels of aggression. More than anything, they make the safety of punishing Freya's openings much more questionable. Rather than spawning in waves of 11 like Rom, there's a set amount at the start and a long buffer before any more spawn. Even when they do, it's one at a time spaced out fairly well. Far more metered with less focus on mowing down basic enemies in a boss battle. You can even sacrifice your left arm to use a torch that completely nullifies them. With their fear of fire, they'll completely ignore you, of course, while forcing you to complete the fight one-handed. 
there's a surprising amount of thought that goes into the player's engagement with Freya, as there clearly was in her design to force that kind of decision making. I won't pretend she needs to be rivaling Artorius or Gale on the boss charts anytime soon, but Freya is an excellent battle amidst a bloated Dark Souls 2 roster that deserves more credit than I've given it in the past. Number 9, Phalanx. Making masterful use of one of the best opening levels in the series, your battle with Phalanx is shaped by what you gathered and learned from your journey through the Boletarian Palace. If you discovered the bounty of firebombs and resin, you'll be well equipped to take advantage of a subtle tip given by the undead warriors. Note that throughout the stage they use standard arms. However, in the descending tower shortcuts, their weapons are little blades. In the first tower, this may seem like a difficulty bump, but the second quickly points toward their battle against miniature phalanx monsters. With a shield and spear, their only vulnerability outside of using the rear is fire. When you finally encounter the mastermind behind a spartan wall of shields, fire becomes your biggest ally. Either whack away mindlessly under fire of countless spears with a standard weapon, or make your own personal fireworks show with their burning corpses en route to the helpless jelly at the center. Matching the story of an archer turned demon who sniped while others lost their lives on the front lines for her, Phalanx's demonic fate was to be defenseless once you fry her guardians. There's something intoxicating about seeing a demon recoil from you, helpless to stop your assault. It's a final hammer into the idea that the well-prepared will survive this world. Make use of everything you find to claim the souls of the demons. Defeating Phalanx is the gateway to consuming those souls for strength with the Maiden in Black, and opens the art stones for further demon slaying. There's something to be said about storytelling and teaching game mechanics in active combat. While it may not be the most exhilarating the series has to offer, it certainly has its place among FromSoft's notable bosses. Number 8, Asylum Demon. Throw all that preparation to the wind in favor of a 10-ton surprise crashing down upon you mere seconds after you hit new game. Equipped with a shoddy broken sword worth paltry damage and zero healing capabilities, you're left naked against a colossal threat. It's one of the few times in the series that running away is a viable answer and you can be rewarded for overcoming the enormous challenge to gain a powerful weapon in the tutorial if you stick it out. It's one of sadly few examples of skill awarding you with situational rewards in these games, not unlike cutting tails for weapons in the very same game. A starting gift of black firebombs can trivialize that challenge, but you give up the master key, an extraordinarily valuable way to open your possibilities early on. In a way, like Phalanx, it also teaches you to fight prepared for your opponent, even tipping you off about plunge attacks. Offensively, it's a considerable challenge for the uninitiated. Even now, knowing to hug and smack that jiggling booty, its hammer has hefty range and sweep potential from behind. Undead Asylum is one of the best openings in any game I've played, one that is cemented by a demon setting the tone for the unforgiving journey to come. Number 7, Lady Butterfly. This is another example of a well-executed concept FromSoft missed the mark on previously. Before we proceed, you have to promise you won't laugh. Promise? I strongly considered Pinwheel for this list in my initial brainstorming. I know, I know, I know. He's a series signature punching bag. However, it's clear to me Pinwheel was intended to be an enticing option earlier in the game when he wouldn't be quite as pathetic. Killing him earns you one of the game's best armor pieces and the right of kindling, essentially double healing for the rest of your game as long as you can fuel your bonfires with humanity. The problem is the skeletons steer you away from his lair early on, particularly the Bone Wheel variant. I seriously don't know what possessed the developers to look at the Shrine of Storm's infinitely somersaulting skellies and say, what if we put a wheel on that for better aerodynamics? Even if you're able to brave the Bone Wheel Assault and survive, Pinwheel is far more annoying to fight than fun when he isn't obliterated in 10 seconds. Think Whack-A-Mole, except the moles are tanky, fire devastating spells, and won't stop reproducing until you're up to your ears in floating madmen. A trial in frustration at best, and a curb stomp at worst. Lady Butterfly also offers notable rewards, the Sakura Droplet, an entire extra revive charge, and a flat increase to attack power. This gives you the option to charge your combat potential before fighting Genichiro, a massive wall for beginners, but also easier slaughtering of the many mini bosses beforehand for extra HP through beads. She's a direct path to an easier time with the more difficult battles to come, but hardly gives her bounty up for free. You have to battle through Juzuo the Drunkard, who in the early game is very tough. It's a gank battle intended for you to make use of ninjutsu and skills you won't even have to even the odds. Assuming you can brute force your way through, Lady Butterfly is arguably more challenging than all of them combined. With fast, irregularly paced strikes, ranged attacks, and tightrope traps, she keeps layered pressure on you at all times. It's important for you to find the gaps in these layers to make use of advice or fight shares that is vital to success in Sekiro. 
Vitality damage is permanent, and at moderate and severe levels will dramatically reduce an enemy's ability to recover posture. With fully draining vitality or breaking posture is the only way to achieve a death blow, whittling down both in tandem is key to victory, especially for newer players without the confidence to constantly engage and keep the posture meter rising. The first phase emphasizes this stance, while the second utilizes her genjutsu for dangerous ranged abilities and illusionary adds to make attacking her an ill-advised gambit. You can use snap seeds obtained outside her room, or a bounty from the serpent's past to dispel them, or run wildly until they're gone. The former uses a valuable, limited resource, while the latter will surely allow her to regain posture if you haven't done substantial vitality damage as advised. Strategic decision making between resources, offense, and defense, and ensuring you can dodge all the combatants and flurry of magic they eventually wither into is a lot for new players to handle. The rhythm when engaged with her is exhilarating, even if keeping up with it is difficult due to her intentional gaps to catch you spamming deflections without thought. She has so much to teach the player, excellent combat design, and a lot to offer in her defeat. She is more easily defeated by veterans, but it is still a fun early game romp or an easy late game stomp that gives you a boost exactly when you want it. Either way, the battle asks the right amount from the player in an immensely engaging way. Often forgotten in Sekiro's grand experience, Lady Butterfly is criminally undervalued. Number 6, Lothric and Lorien, the Twin Princess. Naturally, my rankings are always biased. There's perhaps no boss in the series I've been more biased toward than the Twin Princess. At the tail end of my initial playthrough, this duo beat me down dozens of times in my 15th straight hour of play. I chalked it up to fatigue until I speed ran the game and realized, no, I really just do suck that bad at fighting the twin princes. I get plenty of comments that can't believe I found them difficult, and yet your taunts didn't stop the beatings. It wasn't until I took an extended break from the games the last few years and recently returned that I found the culprit. I was too greedy. I know, shock and awe, am I right? Dark Souls 3 is often solved by spamming R1 with straight swords. They're simply too good to ignore for my inner unga bunga. Where they don't shine is against bosses that demand you manage your stamina carefully. Like, I don't know, bosses that teleport randomly and vary the length of their combos with no discernible tell? It's really that simple, and yet when I did a new playthrough focusing on magic and the Moonlight Greatsword, I was... Well, let's be honest, just as greedy as ever. Even so, the Moonlight Greatsword not being as dominant in terms of damage made me more reactive. Once you play this fight on the Prince's terms, it becomes a lot easier to read. My inner salt mines clearing out also let their quality shine brilliantly. Bosses that punish excessive greed are a good thing. You shouldn't be able to mindlessly spam R1 and win if you want an engaging bout. Gale doesn't allow that, neither does Medir, Soul of Cinder, Freed, or Nameless King. I realize I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, I'm telling myself. The Princes are a phenomenal example of the meter dance that Souls Combat provides through managing offensive and defensive stamina usage. Sure, Lorien can teleport at will, but this isn't an issue assuming you budget your stamina with that in mind. The first phase fighting exclusively Lorien teaches you everything you need to know about his moveset. Play on his terms and there are clear openings. This persists into the second phase with those windows becoming obscured with Lothric's magical assaults. Balancing it all while trying to strike at the back to hit Lothric is thrilling. Lorien's diminished health pool is intended to ensure you have free windows to strike at Lothric, and a momentary breath to guarantee healing and buffs as he explosively revives his fallen brother. Playing with moderate aggression turns this into a fascinating battle of endurance, one I believe stands right amongst Dark Souls 3 best, which is saying a lot. Half a decade later, I'm on record admitting I underrated the Twin Princess. Number 5, Genichiro Ashina. It's arguable to say Genichiro is even underrated. While he's outshined by the likes of Ishin the Sword Saint, Father Owl, and perhaps even the polarizing Demon of Hatred, few would argue he's heavily in the discussion for a top 5 spot. I'm here to argue that not only is he worth that, Genichiro has merit warranting consideration for the top spot. Like a few other bosses on the list, first and foremost, I respect him as a learning tool. Genichiro is the quintessential get good boss of Sekiro. He he kicked my teeth in until I was scrambling for dentures in my first playthrough. With a soul's background, I was still adamant that dodging had a role to play. His moveset forces you to engage in the tango of swordplay, sink or swim. If you refuse, you'll be six feet under in the blink of an eye. If you take up the challenge, you'll find smooth as silk guidance into learning every facet of Sekiro's combat. This symphony of adrenaline crescendos as you attack, peaking at his inevitable counter. As the tempo changes, you must read his moves. 
Will it be a slash from the right? Or maybe the left? A jump in the air and a thrust? Or perhaps a sweep? Calculating those possibilities in your head with heart racing might catch you swinging carelessly or spamming deflections. Ganeshiro loves backstepping in those moments of overstepping to give you an arrow barrage. You learn through each strike when to pressure, the flash that indicates an immediate defensive shift, and constant vigilance for lulls in his pressure. Throughout his two health bars, he'll introduce elements like the jump into a sweep, but can still pull out the thrust in a surprise gambit to keep you guessing all the way into the final phase that incorporates lightning strikes that if capitalized on can provide a massive advantage or a brutal shock from start to electrifying finish this battle elevates your gameplay as Genichiro rises to match your every improvement rapid succession that outpaces Genichiro turning the tides from your brief tutorial romp with you eventually tossing him aside like a rag doll in the finale en route to the sword saint that battle is of course incredible in its own right but let us not forget the underrated roots that style of battle was founded upon number four false king alant much like Genichiro, False King Alant is fairly rated within his own game. Most wouldn't argue against top three, with plenty giving him the number one nod. Sadly, Demon Soul's experimental boss design is extremely hit or miss, with later iterations building upon the framework of the hits to create better battles. In the case of Alant, he was a game-breaking grand slam for his time. Quite simply, if you look toward later battles such as Artorius, Gwyn, Fume Knight, Sir Alone, Garmin, Gale, even the Sword Saint, all lend themselves to the backbone the False King provided. Shirking the convention held through the majority of the game, there's no hulking beast, no puzzle, no tricks. Just a demon fully capable of imposing his will upon you. His methodical walk as the organ rings through the cathedral pierces you with a sense of dread. Every step, every move he makes spells your demise. When he finally engages, his shouts echo throughout the hall, driving home the strength of his blows, and the windy after effects many of them provide. Similar to Kanichiro, you must be constantly vigilant. Without a moment's hesitation, the False King can fly to your side with a slice followed by the aforementioned wind. Dodging backwards is a losing strategy which pressures you to stay within his reach, a dangerous place to be. His flurries are deceptively fast, their tracking is excellent, and his periodic nonchalance makes finding gaps for your offense very challenging. This can be particularly costly for longer windups as he is capable of grabbing you and sucking the souls right out of you. That's right, Alant is the sole boss in the series capable of leveling you down mid-battle. Imagine getting destroyed for hours only to lose half a dozen soul levels along the way. As if you weren't struggling enough. His saving grace for you is his charged explosion, one you really, really want to snap him out of. Its range is massive and the damage is absurd. Of course, the free damage opportunity can also be a trap based on his aggression. Sometimes you're free to get a few hits in, other times he snaps right into another combo, leaving you staggered and obliterated. His coup de grace is that in a game where magic is absurdly dominant, he is resistant to it. If you made your mark throughout the game using spells, Alant will be a sudden wall that was plenty difficult already as it was. His moveset and damage are balanced well for the endgame, the pressure he exerts is monumental, the setting is spectacular, the music in both the original and remake offer different yet welcome changes in tone, and the reward for besting him is euphoric. The prototypical humanoid night fight the series often finds its best boss footing on all started with the false kick. He may not be better than those who followed, but his quality and impact are well beyond being lost as a fading memory. Number 3, Emma the Gentle Blade and Ishin Ashina. Without question, the most underrated end boss in the series, simply due to a large number of players never experiencing the Shura ending. It's understandable. Burning your playthrough to the ground halfway through is a devilish proposition. Sadly, if you've never been willing, you're missing out on one of the best experiences Sekiro has to offer. From a story standpoint, it's intense, more so than anything else in the game. You honor the Shinobi Code and stand by Father Al when he requests you turn Kuro over to him. Emma, of course, who had been helping you to sever or purify the Lord's mortality, doesn't take too kindly to the coat turn. After working together for your entire run to this point, pulling your sword against Emma feels twisted in a way. She's no slouch though. 
Emma is an absolute savage with a blade. Her fight plays out similarly to Genichiro with less variation in her abilities. Even so, her attacks are swifter with a lot more force. A single mistake leads to massive damage and, in severe cases, instant death. It's a lot to handle, especially if you haven't mastered the combat, which is unlikely assuming this is your first ending. It swells the air of tension even further into something more sinister as you fight desperately to claim Emma's life. As you do, her dying breath of Shura hammers in the path you're going down. There's nothing in the series other than perhaps Maiden Astraya that feels so merciless as killing Emma. Ishin is well aware of how dire your change is. Look at the focus and malice in that stare as he unsheaths his blade. You'd better be ready because Ishin Ashina isn't too far from his saintly counterpart. I would argue for the very first HP level, he's actually harder than the Sword Saint. He shares a lot of the same moves, but has a grab and an even more deadly fake out backslash. Anytime he isn't attacking, if you hit a single R1, he can duck the hit and counter before you can hit again. Your only option is to deflect, but recognizing your attack failing and deflecting in time is easier said than done. This single maneuver can devastate your healing resources before phase two, when he unleashes fire to spike the deadliness and range of his blows. These extended attacks are really difficult to deal with in such a small space. Healing windows feel non-existent as well. In the sword same battle, you can simply run a half marathon and chug along. At the top of Ashina Tower, nowhere is safe from his closing speed. The ending it all leads to is satisfying in a dark, twisted way if that's your thing. Personally, it makes me feel like I'm a terrible person, which I guess I am because I can hardly ignore experiencing this amazing duo at least once every few playthroughs for the sheer quality. I wouldn't say they outmatch Genichiro, the Sword Saint, or even Father Owl overall, but there's no question this little played route contains heavily underrated bosses amongst an ominous atmosphere that is a must-play experience. Number 2, Yorm the Giant in terms of the sheer disrespect Yorm gets, he has a strong argument as the most underrated boss altogether. At release, he was showered with criticism of being a disappointment of expectations. Where was the epic battle with the giant teased in the opening? Why was it so easy to claim victory? The latter complaint which compounded as we experienced multiple playthroughs and storm ruled the big boy effortlessly. I understand the perspective. Your reps against Yorm are always building upon the same skill set. No matter your build, the fight plays out the same. You pick up the Storm Ruler and need to find a way to charge the blade and strike him five times. I can't argue that in comparison, dozens upon dozens of bosses across the series that he isn't on the easier end of the spectrum. Which poses the question, does a Souls boss have to be difficult to be good? Miyazaki is on record stating his games are not about difficulty, rather he wants to back you into dire situations and see how the player responds spawns, and most importantly, how they feel when they best the circumstances. Looking at this from the perspective of Yorm, being thrust into a battle with the Titan in a relatively small throne room with none of your weapons being effective is pretty alarming. You find loot near the throne that offers the solution. Use a weapon art that takes time to charge, and it will allow you to effectively slice the air and the giant. Finding time to charge the blade as he strikes, slams, stomps, and chases you is exhilarating. Yes, if you learn his tells, you'll know when to best charge and unleash the strike. Yes, hiding under his feet can be effective at the right times, even if he stuns you with a roar. It doesn't alleviate the match of wits between the both of you to find those weaknesses in one another. In short, my answer to how I respond to Yorm and how I feel when I best him is elated, exhilarated, filled with that signature victory euphoria the series is known for. Even after speedrunning the game to death, I still have a smile on my face every time I enter Yorm's lair. Do I have the advantage these days, sure, but it doesn't mean I can't enjoy every moment of clashing with the giant. When it comes to sheer entertainment, Yorm is an absolute success. He'd be hands down my choice for the most underrated if it weren't for a particular meatball from our favorite black sheep. And the number one most underrated boss in the Soul series, the Rotten. This amalgamation of rotted flesh is a divine beast capable of making all your builds flourish. As a battle, he's far greater than he gets credit for. His windups vary dramatically, testing the limits of your patience, stamina management, quick twitch timing, and your ADP stat. The fiery arena forces you to watch your footing as you evade lest you become roasted. He'll pursue you constantly, never giving you a moment to heal in a game reliant on using sweet, sweet candy to keep you going. You have to earn healing windows by dodging. 
He may deceptively pull off, hand covering his chest, but I swear the moment you take advantage he'll punish you. He has several variations on similar moves that can be difficult to read until you master the battle. He even has an explosion with a deceptively quick windup that requires you to be vigilant and back off. The constant back and forth requires your stamina management to be perfect, forcing you to keep greed in check despite the large openings many attacks give when evaded correctly. For a final advantage on your end, you can even cut off his limbs to make him useless. All of this packs a lot of what I love about today's list into one disgusting package. As an underrated boss, he's certainly deserving of today's list. What skyrockets him to the top is what he allows for in tandem with what he guards and an exclusive Dark Souls 2 item. Bonfire Estix allow you to choose a single bonfire and raise everything close to it to a new game cycle, including the boss. And the Rotten just so happens to be one of the highest soul reward bosses in the main game. If you master his fight, you could beat him without taking a single hit, making the new game cycle irrelevant. He also just so happens to be guarding the Shulva City DLC, one that has access to a load of Bonfire Estix. If you need more, simply find Dark Diver Grandel in all three of his locations. One is right next to the Rotten, another after the Shrouded Forest that only requires a single fragrant branch to reach, and the last is behind the Shrine of Winter, which normally requires getting all four major lords killed, the one exception being if you've amassed a million total souls across your playthrough. A feat made quite easy through smacking New Game Plus Rotten Booty with the Estix you gain from the DLC and as a gift in the beginning. In that DLC, you can also find Flynn's Ring, Bright bugs and powerful upgrade materials well beyond what you should be able to access after only having killed the rotten. After you've amassed a million souls in effort that only takes a handful of rotten kills, you can buy another 10 Estix from Grendel. In my most recent playthrough, I was soul level 218 having killed only 5 total bosses with a fully upgraded Moonlight Greatsword and 16 Crystal Soul Spear, all thanks to the Estix. I was able to take on 36 other bosses with the exact build I wanted as early as possible thanks to the Rotten's gracious sacrifice. I'm at the point where I've beaten each game a dozen times over. Keeping things interesting means creating interesting runs, sometimes finding ways to break the games that once upon a time broke me. The Rotten allows you to do that more effectively than any other boss in the entire series and packs a highly underrated battle to boot. For being massively undervalued on both fronts, he's without question my unconventional choice for the most underrated boss in the Souls series. But what about you? There's nearly 200 bosses in the series at this point, so surely there's some bosses I missed. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and of course, I want to thank you for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.